Uh, now, in the last lecture, we dealt with uh, diffusion control growth in binary systems, and the particular binary system that we considered was the iron carbon system, although it could have been anything uh, in which one species dissolves less in the product phase than in the parent phase. And if you remember, the compositions at the interface were given by a tie line of the equilibrium phase diagram for the transformation temperature at which we were doing the calculation. And again, to remind you, that tie line of the equilibrium phase diagram comes by drawing a common tangent to the free energy codes of alpha and gamma, because that gives you the same chemical potential of iron in alpha and gamma and of carbon in alpha and gamma. So even though these phases have different chemical compositions, there's no tendency for diffusion. Does everybody understand what I've just said? So, uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, the term chemical potential is something you don't follow. Okay, so let me explain what the chemical potential is. I just got my computer from going to sleep. the equilibrium composition is we draw a common tangent mm -hmm. to this curve. Okay. And I'll draw that. And that gives us x alpha gamma and x gamma alpha. And supposing that I have a material which has this <coughs> composition x bar here, average concentration, okay, then the free energy of that solution is this point here, G of x bar, right? Now, I'm going to write this point over here, if we have, if we have iron here and carbon here, then this point will give me mu alpha for iron same as mu gamma for iron. I'll explain what that means in a second. Okay. And this point gives me mu alpha carbon equal to mu alpha uh, gamma carbon. Okay. Now, let's just focus on a single one of these curves. If I take the free energy of that solution, then it is the weighted mean of the free energy of iron in that solution plus the free energy of carbon in that solution. Okay. So we can just write that the free energy of a solution is equal to the concentration of iron times the chemical potential of iron plus the concentration of carbon times the chemical potential of carbon. All the chemical potential means is that it is the mean free energy of iron in a solution of that composition. And similarly, mu C means the mean free energy of carbon in a solution of that composition. So this is the contribution made by carbon to the free energy of a solution and the contribution made by iron to the free energy of that solution. That's all it means. We are partitioning the free energy into a contribution due to iron and carbon. And of course, when we draw a common tangent, the free energy of iron in alpha is exactly the same as the free energy of iron in gamma. And similarly, for these two cases. And therefore, even though these are different chemical compositions, when you put them in contact, there's no tendency for diffusion. The diffusion is really driven by free energy gradients, not by concentration gradients. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So that's the origin, really, of this common tangent construction, is that the free energy of, a sp of every species is uniform <coughs> in the whole system. So whether it's alpha or gamma, it's uniform. And therefore, there's no tendency for diffusion, even though the concentrations may be 
Have you ever thought, uh, you know, why when you have ice forming in salty water, yeah, the ice is purer than salty water, and yet it's in equilibrium with that. You know, there's no tendency for salt from the water to diffuse into the ice. It's because your chemical potentials are uniform. So that's the origin of the common tangent. So, 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 I'm sorry, 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 I
except that we have an additional degree of freedom now because we've got two solutes. So I can, I can rock that tangent plane and still remain in contact with these two surfaces. So there's a whole set of tie lines here at a constant temperature, which define the alpha plus gamma phase field at a constant temperature. Uh, and the problem, uh, which I outlined in the last lecture, was how do we choose which tie line determines the concentrations at interface? Well, uh, this is uh, that uh, flat portion here drawn out again. So it's basically a constant temperature section of a ternary phase diagram. You're plotting the carbon concentration here, the manganese concentration here. This is the alpha phase field, the gamma phase field. And these tie lines are obtained by rocking that tangent plane while mainsta maintaining contact with the free energy surfaces. Now, supposing I have an alloy of this composition, then you could argue that this is the tie line which governs the interface composition. That would be a very sensible conclusion, that if I have an alloy which lies over here, it's this tie line which determines the interface composition. If I'm here, then it's this tie line, and so on. Okay, okay let's, let's assume that. Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to write this equation here. This is for the binary case, that as the interface moves, <coughs> the rate at which solute is partitioned is equal to the rate at which solute is carried away from the interface by diffusion. Yeah. Do you remember this equation? Yeah? Happy with it? Okay, so this is simply the rate at which solute is partitioned as the interface moves, and that has to be carried away by diffusion. Mind you, this is the concentration profile we have at the interface, plotting distance. So there's nothing new I'm drawing here, it's just a reminder. Distance versus concentration. And here we have uh, C bar, which is the average concentration. This is C alpha gamma and C gamma alpha. And this is the position of the interface set stuff. And as the interface advances, That much solute has to be pushed ahead in a time delta t, and therefore we have this equation, C gamma alpha minus C alpha gamma times the velocity of the interface is the rate of solute partition. And that will be equal to the diffusion flux down this gradient. In order to maintain these concentrations constant, those two must balance. Now, of course, when we have two species diffusing, We've got to have two equations like this. Okay. Uh, so, so the diffusion flux here will the, the flux of one, uh, the species one, let's say carbon, will depend not only on the gradient of its own concentration, but also on the gradient of the second species. <coughs> And similarly, the, so, uh, the diffusion flux of manganese will depend not only on the gradient of manganese, but also on the gradient of carbon. Now, the big difference between carbon and manganese is that one is a substitutional solute, and the other is an interstitial solute. So you can imagine that the interstitial solute diffuses much, much faster. In fact, at typical temperatures, it will diffuse eight orders of magnitude faster than the substitution solute. So, bearing in mind that we have to satisfy this equation, we have two such equations now, one for the carbon and one for the manganese. So I could write down that C gamma alpha carbon minus C alpha gamma carbon into the velocity of the interface, which is simply dz star by dt, will be equal to minus the diffusion coefficient of carbon times the gradient of carbon 
there is this interaction term here. So minus the fusion coefficient of uh, carbon, which depends on the gradient of manganese times the gradient of manganese. Okay, so that's one equation. And we have a second equation which deals with the concentration of manganese and how it diffuses <coughs> times velocity will be equal to minus the diffusion coefficient of manganese and its gradient less the interaction of the gradient of carbon. We have two equations to satisfy now, not just one equation. These two V's differ because of This? Yeah. No, there's only one interface moving. That's a very okay, good point. It's not to be yeah, it's, not it's a very good point. You see, we've got to solve these equations simultaneously with one velocity. Okay. And that is uh, leading to the difficulty, which I will show you in a second. You know, there's eight orders of magnitude difference in the diffusion coefficients of manganese and carbon, and yet we have to satisfy these, each of these equations with just one interface moving. Everyone happy with these equations? Yep. It's simply a generalization of this one. And I'm going to simplify it by ignoring this interaction between these coefficients. Okay. So we are not going to deal with these equations. Yeah. Are they very small? They can be very small. When is the iron figure in all this? OK, so when we consider binary, we only looked at the diffusion of carbon, didn't we? Oh, because yeah. the concentration of iron is 1 minus that of carbon. I don't want you to worry too much about this as long as you understand it. Yeah. You're not going to put numbers and solve the equations. So we, we now have a pair of equations here, which we have to solve simultaneously, given that the diffusion coefficient of carbon is eight orders of magnitude larger than of manganese. So the diffusion coefficient of carbon is approximately 10 to the eight times the diffusion coefficient of manganese. You see, you could say these <coughs> terms are different, you know, if I take the values from the equilibrium phase diagram, then this is C alpha gamma carbon, and this is C alpha gamma, uh, gamma alpha carbon. They are different, and you might imagine that we could solve these equations, even though these are eight orders of magnitude different. But the differences between concentrations are not large enough to account for eight orders. So if I simply said that, look, if I have an alloy of this composition, it's this tie line, in general, we won't be able to satisfy these equations. So how do we solve this? OK, just uh, all, all the notes you should have in your write-ups. But can you just uh, focus for, for a short while? Right? What we are going to do is we are going to say that we will take a tie line which reduces the gradient of carbon to compensate for the large diffusion coefficient. So imagine that we have an alloy of this composition and we want to see which tie line determines the diffusion control growth. 
if I draw a vertical line through this point, then the carbon concentration in the austenite here, is given by this point here, is the same as the average concentration in the alloy. Right? So, so my diffusion profile, which lo will look very, very flat, because C alpha gamma, gamma alpha of carbon, is the same as C bar. So if I draw a vertical line through this and pick this tide line, then I flatten the gradient of carbon, don't I? Yeah? And therefore, I compensate for the large diffusion coefficient by forcing a small gradient, and then the manganese can keep pace with the carbon. So you can see uh, I'm plotting distance along here and across the carbon concentration here that for this tie line, the gradient of carbon is almost zero. Okay. So that compensates for the very large diffusion coefficient of carbon, and the corresponding concentration profile for manganese is given by this point here and this point here. Okay. So we have long-range diffusion of manganese here. We have a flat gradient of carbon, compensate for the large diffusion coefficient and therefore we can satisfy the two equations for machines. Everyone happy with that? What work do you have to say about it? That we're doing the tie line that's not actually through the... To the alloy composition. That's correct. What, how can you say that? I mean, you, just, I mean, you said do a vertical line, but that's, that's just because you said look through Yeah, yeah, line. exactly. You can do it in any line. Um, yeah. Well, if you choose any line, you wouldn't be able to satisfy. That's, that's the problem. Are we basically saying that all the carbon diffuses out and it didn't need concentrate immediately, and you're sort of saying it's sort of saving straight all the way, and then you've got my green size to catch up with that? Yes. Yeah. Let's just, let's just uh, bear with me, right? Because there's another possibility of, of drawing this vertical line and selecting this other line. See, instead of making the gradient of carbon flat, we could actually increase the gradient of manganese. Okay. And the way that you would increase the gradient of manganese is that you partition very little manganese. Okay. If uh, the solubility of manganese in ferrite is the same as the average manganese concentration, then you will be partitioning very little manganese, right? So the alternative possibility is this, that I have an alloy here, I'm going to draw a horizontal line through it so that the manganese concentration of the ferrite is the same as the average manganese concentration. Okay. Yeah, you can see the manganese concentration of the ferrite is the same as the average concentration. And that gives me that tie line. And now, you see, the gradient of manganese becomes extremely steep. So that compensates for the slow diffusion of manganese. And we have this long-range diffusion of carbon. Okay, so there is a second way in which we can solve these equations. Yeah, everyone happy with the construction? Okay, so how does the system know whether it should draw a vertical line or a horizontal line? I mean, that was essentially your question, right? Okay, so let's let's think about this a little bit more. So the basis of those constructions, you understand that in one case. We are increasing the gradient of carbon to compensate for the very fast diffusion. In the second case, we are increasing the gradient of manganese to compensate for the slow diffusion of manganese. And in both cases, we are maintaining equilibrium at the interface because the interface compositions are given by a tie line of the phase diagram. So, these modes are all known as local equilibrium modes of growth because the interface compositions are given by a tie line. So there is local equilibrium at the interface for, for both carbon and for manganese. We are satisfying these rate equations. And in this case, there is almost zero partitioning of manganese. So this is known as the negligible partitioning local equilibrium mode. And it occurs at very high supersaturations. I will explain that a bit more. 
And I forgot to mention that in the previous slide, because we have lots of partitioning of manganese, we call this the partitioning local equilibrium mode. And this happens at low supersaturations. In other words, you're supercooled only a little bit outside of the optimal phase mode. So the question was, how do we know which of these modes will actually happen? Right. So carbon, manganese, and this is my alpha plus gamma phase field. And supposing I take uh, I take an alloy here okay, at a high supersaturation far away from the gamma phase field. And I try to make it, I try to draw a vertical line through this instead of a horizontal line. Okay. So I draw a vertical line through this and pick that as my tie line. Can you see anything wrong with that? So now the interface compositions are given by that point and that point, and that is the average. Yeah, it's not possible. Look, both of them have got a higher manganese concentration than the average. Now, if I go back and we try to do the same thing, So I have an alloy here, which is transforming at low supersaturation, and in this case we drew a vertical line, but I'm going to draw a horizontal line to pick the tie line. So anything wrong with that? Yeah, exactly. So that's not possible either. And it turns out that if I connect these two points here, then transformation will always happen in this region by the partitioning local equilibrium mode, and in this region by the negligible partitioning local equilibrium mode. So if your alloy falls in this region, you draw a horizontal line. If your alloy falls in this region, you draw a vertical line to choose the tie. It's not a straight line. It's not a straight line, no. So how do you draw that line? Yeah, uh, it's only by calculation. Okay, so let me show you exactly how to draw that line. Carbon, manganese. And I've got a series of tile lines here, which I've obtained using thermodynamics. Okay, so getting equal chemical potentials. If I draw right-handed triangles, on each of these tie lines. And I join up the vertices of all those right-handed triangles, then I get that line which divides the phase field into negligible partitioning and um, partitioning equilibrium. So any alloy that falls on this vertical line will transform with that tie line, and then it falls on that. What do you call the line? This line, uh, there's no particular name for it. It's just dividing the domain into NPLE and PLE. So there is actually a unique solution to equations. Here, the same same diagram. That we did. If you try to do the other way, it simply doesn't make physical sense. So the system naturally chooses a manner which satisfies these two equations simultaneously, maintains mass balance. You know, you can't have both the austenite and ferrite being greater in manganese than the average composition. So that, that um, I think, you know, it appears difficult, but it's not really <coughs> difficult when you think about it. And what we've done is we've actually done diffusion control growth in a system with two solutes which diffuse at a very different rate. And this is quite a powerful concept that you've absorbed. Yeah? 
and to generalize it to many components is just trivial. Okay? You just have more and more of these equations to solve simultaneously. It's hard to illustrate, of course, but when you deal with equations, you don't need to illustrate. As long as you've understood the concept with a ternary, you can deal with quaternary or whatever. So, so far, what we have discussed is diffusion control growth with equilibrium being maintained at the interface. In other words, the interface compositions are connected by a tie line of the phase diagram. Now, as the temperature, transformation temperature drops, the diffusion of manganese becomes incredibly difficult. And what we get is we get a breakdown of equilibrium. So, uh, if we look at this concentration profile here, it's very, very steep. Eventually, this diffusion distance becomes less than an interatomic spacing, which means it doesn't make physical sense. And manganese simply stops diffusing. But carbon can continue partitioning between the two phases. So we've lost equilibrium when that happens. This, this profile becomes completely flat when we go to a low enough temperature where the diffusion of manganese becomes too sluggish. So we, we can no longer talk about equilibrium. We can no longer use an equilibrium phase diagram. We use instead what's known as a para-equilibrium phase diagram. That means that a phase diagram in which manganese doesn't diffuse, but carbon does partition within the phases. So you can see it looks different from the other phase diagram. Now, if I asked you about the orientation of the tie lines, what could you tell me? They're going to be horizontal because the manganese concentration in the ferrite and austenite is identical. Okay. It's actually, strictly speaking, it's the ratio of the manganese to iron atoms which remains constant. So this is no longer an equilibrium diagram. It's a constrained equilibrium in which you allow carbon to reach a homogeneous chemical potential subject to the constraint that the substitution of solid doesn't partition. Okay. So this is almost like binary. You can use all the equations for binary to calculate the growth rate because only carbon is diffusing. Okay. Now notice that there is one other difference here. Yeah, if we compare with the equilibrium phase diagram, you can see there's a large gap here, and that vanishes to a point here. Why do you think that is? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, and, and what you said is also right. That here we have no carbon. And the iron manganese is behaving like a pure substance. That means that alpha goes to gamma at a particular concentration or a particular temperature. So it's behaving like a pure substance. Okay? And if I take my equilibrium phase diagram and I draw inside it a para-equilibrium phase diagram, then it will look like this. So this is the para-equilibrium phase diagram. Why do they meet here? Sorry? Yeah, I mean, the, if there's no manganese, there's no difference between a binary and a ternary, right? This is the zero manganese concentration, so they've got to meet here and here, right? There you are. That's the para equilibrium phase diagram inside the equilibrium phase field, and they meet when the concentration of manganese becomes zero. Of course, the tie lines of the para equilibrium phase diagram are horizontal. we've covered something really advanced that in, in about 40 minutes or, or less. Yeah. We've generalized diffusion control growth in binary systems to ternary systems and then you could 
carry that process on to higher order systems. And we've also dealt with a special case of constrained equilibrium where the manganese doesn't partition, but subject to that constraint, a carbon redistributed in the transformation. So effectively, it becomes like a binary system. And the vast majority of uh, steels, because we try to produce very fine grain structures, we transform them at a low temperature. And the para equilibrium phase diagram would apply there rather than equilibrium, which makes life very simple, you know, because it becomes effectively like a binary phase diagram. Any questions? 